members that are up here, they all um, brought, are bringing something different to the table, so it's great to have them uh, give us their time today. Uh, and at this time, uh, we are going to open up for discussion, for questions from the audience. Um, we also have some questions from some folks that are listening online. So we'll kind of jump back and forth. Um, they're still online on the phone, so we're going to do our best to repeat questions and hopefully they can still hear this portion of the, the panel discussion. So we'll start out if there's anybody from the audience that has any questions or comments for any of our panel members. Are we, um, are we sometimes too aggressive in the, I guess, the number of acres that we try to reconstruct and that we can't, you know, look at smaller sites and do a better job managing post-management? Um, you know, there's large projects. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I backed off on our restorations because I was, I, when, when we restore a site, um, I compare it to opening a can of worms, you know, and you're going to have to babysit it, so to speak. Uh, and you can only do that. As, I mean, I have two, almost 250 WPA spread out over eight counties, you know, so I can't spread myself too thin. Um, and so I was still dealing with some problem child, if you will, you know, and I, I kind of backed off. There was a couple of years there where we hardly restored anything. Um, so, but it all depends on your goals, you know. Uh, there's probably WRP people in here, and they're, they got to go with what, what they get signed up, so. Sometimes we also t maybe don't take on more than we can can handle, but we're not careful about delineating the areas that we're taking on, so that so that if you've got a couple of different, like one one area is wetter and one area is drier, that you take the time to to separate those and give them the right seeds. I think that's some, another another consideration of just how much you can do. Hi, this might be most appropriate for Scott, but I'm curious about when we think of the economics of some of the seeds that are really expensive. Um, is it ever more um, efficient to put in plugs in an area instead of seeds for really expensive seeds and rare seeds? Just not worry about seeds? Well, with plugs, you run into the problem. The first question is, um, plugs or seeds for some of these rare species. What we primarily use plugs for is when we have a limited amount of seed and we want to start increasing that seed production, um, we'll use plugs just to maximize the efficiency of the few ounces of seed you get. And hopefully over time that seed supply will grow exponentially. On small sites and gardens, seeds and plug combination is excellent. but Ultimately, on the larger sites, once you put all those plugs out there and you suddenly have two, three months of poor rainfall, suddenly, like with Madison Audubon, their entire intern help for the summer is going around with the water, watering all their lespedes, lumps the snake in they put in. So I think ultimately, seed is the most economical way to put it on the landscape. I mean, shooting stars, you just have to wait for them. But on a smaller scale, yes, if you need the results sooner rather than later, a public area, um, a school, um, plugs would be very hard. Yeah, I just meant for a few of the species, not the whole mix, just a few species. Mm. Yeah, for, for uh, planting in general, I know some people that started with a fairly low diversity mix CRP planting, and then they have to kind of look at smaller areas that maybe they want to increase the diversity of. Then the plugs would be okay, but I still think that now yeah, you got to mark them and you got to water them, and you have to put them in early enough that they still aren't competing against a lot of other species. Uh, 
this past year, uh, working with a private landowner that had a, a easement with us, um, and he had cropping history on his low areas and on his side hills and hilltops were remnant prairie. Um, we, we bought and also used our home uh, as harvested seed, but to kind of hedge my bets and um, because my interceding efforts on other sites hadn't gone so well, we, um, A, we, we round up, sprayed uh, those lowland areas that were dominated by Kentucky bluegrass. Um, and we also did the plugs and we did 34,000 some plugs. Um, it was uh, about 31 species. And I had never prayed so much for rain in my life. So uh, it was, it's a big experiment in some respects. So uh, Sarah's got her work cut out for her next year doing surveys and seeing what we get for survival. Okay, question from uh, Jerry Zajac. Uh, please comment on the necessity or lack thereof of controlling annual weeds during the year of planting. All I can say is, is that we did control annual weeds during the year of planting. We, did a, we mowed um, all of our sites, and so I don't have anything to compare it against. But eventually, there are two things. Um, eventually, all of those annual weeds went away. Um, we didn't do any spraying, so so I think it was it was it was not harmful to control them, and, and this, the it did allow light to get in. But also, some of those annual weeds are potentially allelopathic to some of the things we don't want, like Canada thistle. There's there's a good reason to believe that that some of, of the things that, uh, that are native to us, but that are, are um, exotic elsewhere, have, have the same properties as, as exotics that come here and, and have these same, that are detrimental to our native species. So I guess I, what I'm getting at is you don't want to be too worried about those annuals, and they can actually be helping you in a big way. They can be helping suppress some um, some weeds that don't have the, um, the 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 exotics that don't have the that, that can't deal with their allelopathic effects like our natives can. Yeah, I think that horseweed is a great cover crop <laughs> if you can get it. In some cases, even ragweed. But um, I think it all depends upon the site, what the weed is, and how much rainfall you've had. So. Obviously, if you've got <clears throat> giant ragweed growing up and it's 10 feet tall, then you probably should have cut it seven months ago. <laughs> but um, So I think it's site dependent and entirely dependent upon what the rainfall is, is that year. And, you know, because it costs you know, a lot of diesel fuel to run the mowers and everything. And, um, if you perceive that, like it's just horse weed, you can see all the seedlings underneath coming along just fine, then maybe it isn't worth, you know, hiring somebody to do that. Yeah, I've, I've gone from, like I said in my uh, presentation, you know, from automatically mowing, almost irregardless of what was there, to really looking at it and um, how much of looking at it is how much of a threat is this to all these native seedlings that, and, um, that are coming and, or not coming. But, uh, so, I don't mow as much foxtail as I used to. You know, um, and I had a site in mine one year uh, that was getting, you know, sweet clover was coming or whatever, and um, it rained, you know, you don't want to run up the field, whatever. By the time we were able to actually go into it, now it was five, six foot tall, and I didn't want to lay all that down. So, and the site's fine. I guess I, what I would add to that is that it's, it's critical when it's needed. And so when is it needed? And the way I would think about that is, is height isn't the only factor, but if, if things are getting a few feet tall out there, it's probably needed. But if stuff is five feet tall, but extremely sparse, you might be able to just leave it alone. 
because you just have one big tall plant here and there and then it might, so maybe the test is is if you can throw a quarter on the ground and see it in most cases or you know you know what I'm getting at then maybe there's not so much shade that you're better off not to do anything because your natives that you planted are getting the sunlight and all of the moisture isn't being sucked up by the high density annual weeds. Long term, those annual weeds, nothing to worry about. They're gonna disappear. But it's what they do in that short term for shading and sucking up moisture <laughs> and those kinds of things that I think are, are you know, the way to think about that. So, when all of the speakers were up, pretty much everybody mentioned um, seeding the maximum diversity possible. Um, when I took ecology, I was told that uh, the rainforests have some of the worst soils in the world. And because of this, no species is allowed to over, um, overproduce and, and outcompete some of the other species. Um, and so when you look at some of the remnant prairie sites we have left, we see this great amount of diversity and a lot of times they're on sandy, gravel, poor soils. Um, and I guess it's a relative measure because we have, putting 50 species in a mix is probably never enough, but um, does anybody put in any consideration into maybe 200 species, 300 species is a lot in um, high production soil, like some of the crop fields that are being turned back into prairie? <laughs> yeah, uh, are you talking seeds per square or species? Species. Okay, well, good luck getting two or three hundred. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. I think maybe the highest one we've ever done was maybe 70. You know, and, and with our combine harvest, you send in, you know, a very small sample lot of a, a big wagon full of seed, you know, and they tell you there are 18 species in it or whatever, you know, so, you know, there's probably double that or a few that they didn't catch, you know, but, yeah, uh, I think if you, unless you have, you know, a $1,000 an acre to spend, you know, you're going to have a hard time, and you're going to have to stretch your local ecotype or, you know, the distance you're willing to take seed from, um, like this year, we're doing a mix, and I forget what species it was, but we had to get it from uh, Western Wisconsin. You know, so. I think uh, on a virgin prairie, even on rich soil, uh, you've got essentially a root zone that is completely occupied, especially in the first few feet. You have some species, um, like lead plant, for example, that could go down to 16 feet with a very leafy dapper. Some species go down until they hit bedrock. But essentially, like a rainforest, a lot of that nutrient is locked up in the plants and their roots and in the plants themselves, the above ground. I think that's why, getting back to my recommendation for analysis of why lead plant should be one of the more dominant species on the prairie, the legumes definitely had an advantage because they fixed their own nitrogen. And so on virgin prairie, that's why I don't think it's surprising that lead plant should be one of the dominant species. So there's that adaptation too, but when we think of the fertility of the prairie soil, essentially it wasn't released until it was plowed under. As a virgin prairie, you've got all those species finding all their individual niches in terms of seed or root depth and um, trying to coexist. And what I found is that if you're doing seed production, monocultures are very unstable because you've got a single species and when they all fill in with their roots they've all competed essentially for the same nutrients it's the same species but you're right if you had two three hundred different species they might all have their own little micro nutrient requirements of, say boron or magnesium or whatever um, orchids have them you know known for their mycorrhizae most of the native plants are known for their fungal relationships so they all have mechanisms to try to deal with that what is essentially a nutrient scarcity because of all the vegetation that's locked that up on that tall grass prairie. 
I was just going to make one comment kind of based on, on what Scott said there that, you know, just an observation that I've had on some of our uh, early um, dormant broadcast seeded projects where there were subtleties within the area that was seeded that speaks to, you know, the more species in the mix, the better. Because what, what you can really see in those projects is how things sorted themselves out. When you move down into a little bit of a lower area where there's a little bit more moisture, there was some cordgrass in that seed mix, and it's amazing how it's now more cordgrass dominated in those low depressions, whereas you get the big blue stem or some of the Indian grasses on the little bit drier portions. And so, so you know, with the subtle varieties, you know, sometimes you've got a nice gravel ridge and you know where the dry prairie is and the music prairie, but sometimes it's just it's a lot harder. You can't go out there and seed, you know, small square footage, so you just get a diverse mix and you'll be surprised how well that stuff will sort itself out. Uh, one thing I want to caution folks on is, you know, so you want to get 60, 70, or 100 species, lots of times you're going to have to go places to get seed that you may not, may not be the best. And, and it, what's bothering me now is I see a lot of the pollinator mixes are coming in, and I've read one where they were going to plant in middle of North Dakota, and I, I'd say half the species never occurred in North, that part of North Dakota. Now, maybe they'll never grow. But now, right, right now, we're, uh, we're getting uh, some of these species spread around, like Retibit panata, which is common. Uh, you, you have to go about 100, 150 miles south here to find the, a native population. Well, it's spreading all over the place now because everybody sits there and puts Retibit, they think it's panata, they put panata in. It's only common inferent in this part of the world. So we're starting to you know start uh, spreading species around that weren't commonly here. So, in the uh, you know the need to get higher species, let's not start spreading species that we may regret. I mean, Rapidit panata <coughs> is actually fairly aggressive, and it's starting to show up as a major dominant species in some of these places. Well, the native population is 150 miles away, so there's a caution there on some of that. And this pollinator, some of these pollinator mixes are are, are you know, I'm a little hesitant to uh, to hopefully see about those things, and also then we promise people 40 species of flower coming. You're going to see 10. Well, that's not going to be that great a deal either, because they're going to see 10 species and wonder where all the 30 went, all the other 30 went. All right, this is a question from Matthew Stasico. Uh, is it possible to control thistle in a restored prairie by spike seeding in conjunction with herbicide or chemical control? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, once, you know, so that was an established period. <coughs> okay, so. Yeah, well, restored prairie. Restored prairie. So you got a thistle problem in a restored prairie. Um, the spike seed is only good if you're going to go ahead and redo the whole, re, you know, do a reconstruction. Um, um, that's the only way I can see how that goes. Uh, you can maybe do a patch, but it's going to take a long time for that patch to eventually cover enough area and do things. I don't, the spikes are it's designed to stop the establishment, not to uh, take out what's already existing there. You, you've already got a problem, so you might be herbicide, um, maybe go a bunch of times herbicide, and once you've got control of that, then you can maybe start doing, adding some more species in, either through interseeding or a patch method, whichever works better for you. Yeah, I have a problem with the problem with thistle. And I think it is a social problem that you have this perceived weed that should be gotten rid of at all costs because it does show up in agriculture. <coughs> However, at least in Wisconsin, I've never found it to be a long-term problem. If you just let the prairie mature, it disappears. Because in my own farm, where I found it growing the most, is in the most compacted soil. That's what it likes. Um, once the roots of the grasses and other forbs start loosening that up, breaking that plow pan, and out competing the thistle, it disappears. And uh, you know, I had to, to, to uh, well, the ag secretary come visit my farm and sure enough, oh, you got some Canada thistle there. <laughs> and it was where I was mowing to control the Canada thistle, and then I realized where I wasn't mowing, it disappeared completely. So while I think it's an initial concern, at least, and I won't extrapolate further west, because I don't have that much experience further than the Cannon River Valley, but at least in Wisconsin, um, 
you know, we mow it so that it doesn't look significant to the neighbors passing by, but ultimately um, it disappears. And in fact, one resident manager actually puts in a lot of um, native thistle into the mix just for the goldfinches and the butterflies. So it does have usefulness for pollinators, but it's on, most thistles are on the blacklist. <laughs> and so I think it's a social issue, not so much an ecological issue. Well, I, I have a lot of experience out in western North Dakota, uh, or South Dakota rather, in uh, Badlands National Park, which is, for the most part, you know, pristine, hasn't been plowed, hasn't been anything, and there's a huge thistle problem there. I don't know what people are going to do about it. I mean, they're spraying it, which hasn't been effective, but I guess I, there is a gradient. And if you go west, I think it can be more of a problem, perhaps. So Only by bison. And not all of it by bison. I cannot um, bite my tongue when it comes to Canada thistle, so. Uh, the point I made to a county weed inspector was, you know, it's been on the noxious list since 1903, and it's as prevalent as ever, so what good is, is the noxious list, you know? And uh, but let, let's be real here, you know, it's, it's not affecting cropland anymore unless the neighbor to the WPA is a organic farmer, and we have it within 50 feet of the boundary, because uh, Roger Becker did seed dispersal studies, and that's about all it can move within a 50 mile an hour wind, the viable seed at least. So, um, yeah, that's my two cents. You sure? You sure can. Do you need to repeat my question? He nailed it. Um, so in Minnesota right now, as far from Minnesota, we've got a mostly a blessing of having a huge new pot of money from legacy grants, or legacy funds, it's former grant money. And so we're able to buy a lot more seed than we ever historically purchased before. And so we've been running up against this debate internally in our office about how to balance uh, trying to maximize your diversity with trying to make sure that you're using local ecotype seed and how exactly you define local. Um, so I was just hoping that you guys could touch on your thoughts about that. For our state seed bid in Wisconsin, we defined local originally into three separate regions in Wisconsin. And we found that that was economically impossible with the money we were given. In terms of bidding it out, we decided Wisconsin and first tier counties of adjacent states would constitute local. And if the grower could prove that, either through third party certification, well, that was the only thing we could use in the bid, um, then they would get, say, 20% preference. So if we bid it out and they bid 100 bucks, you know, we'd knock it back to 80. And they could eventually then get the winning bid. Um, so from a practical standpoint, it's as local as practical. Um, just because of the cost. But I would say though, once you're getting, you know, 400, 500 miles out, then you're gonna see some really differences in local adaptation. If it's black-eyed Susan, you know, who cares? It's planted all over the landscape. But once you start getting these very um, slow growing or more conservative species that stay in one place for a long period of time, those are the ones that'll probably have the most local adaptation and the ones you should be worried about. So I am willing to be rather selective and it depends upon the cost. But some people have the volunteers and the local remnants so they can do all local genotype within 20 mile radius. And they're really lucky. Um, but they have the cheap labor. I really enjoyed everybody's discussions and fantastic. Um, um, Scott, I just have to say though, I, I just have to say while we're all still here together that um, the, the um, conservative species definitions that you, you had used 
we're not at all what I would ever consider conservative species. You know, so I, I, it's the, the, the concept of conservatism, I think, can be a very useful one. Um, I agree with just about everything you said in your talk. But I just have to say that conservatism, at least the way I've used it, it refers to species that have a, a very high fidelity to a high quality natural community. And, and if you're talking about remnants, those are things that you're going to only pretty much find in a remnant. Now, when you're talking about planting, now you have a whole different game. And I find it really interesting to hear what you've, what you've, what you've experienced in your plantings. Um, I think it's really encouraging. Um, one of the questions I have, because I heard you say several times uh, about a scraped place or about a, in my experience, those are the places that are easiest to grow almost everything. <laughs> and some of those places that are devoid of, of uh, organic, rich topsoil um, are wet, they're seepy, where I, in some of the areas I'm familiar with, and some of them are, are very dry and hostile, some of them are both depending on the season of the year. I just wondered if, if uh, you had experienced the same sorts of things. So, okay, so one of the things I've noticed is that in working throughout eight states, that the rules in Minnesota are not necessarily the rules in Missouri, or the rules in Iowa, or the rules, you know, wherever. So I'm wondering if, the, if you've experienced differences even just in soil types where you would say that rule doesn't work anymore. I just put that to anybody, but. Pauline brings important points. Number one, um, as far as conservative is concerned, yes, if you're going by the Swink and Wilhelm model, conservative is, the coefficients of conservatism are based upon the probability that a particular plant will be found on a high quality prairie versus a railroad uh, junkyard or something. And that's one definition. The other definition, back way back in the Stone Age when I was in school, you had two different kinds of species. One that was selected for short life and high reproductive capacity, and the other long life and lower or more spread out reproductive capacity. So black-eyed Susan, ragweed, any annual would be in the first category, and quote, a conservative species might be in the latter category where it's long-lived and fairly moderate to low seed yields spread out over a long period. And that gets into the economics of production where, you know, yield per square foot really makes a difference in profitability. Uh, but as far as nutrients go, most natives are far more efficient with nitrogen than any of our weed species which co-evolved with agriculture in the recent rise in the level of um, synthetic uh, fertilizer. So I don't have a graph as sort of for an orchid talk, but um, if you're looking, for example, at plant tissue culture, the traditional media for that, for your average um, crop, you know, the, the bar for nitrogen may be this high. They have, you know, several thousand millimoles of nitrogen um, per liter. If you try to do the native orchids on a similar mix, they will turn brown and die. You have to cut that nitrogen rate down to much smaller, maybe one-tenth or less of that that's used in those other mixes. In fact, with the orchids, a guy in Sweden figured out they did best when injected with the amino acids he was giving his patients. So there's giving nitrogen in actually a much more natural form that the orchid might use in nature rather than the synthetic forms from urea or ammonium nitrate. Um, so that could be it. Um, you know, I don't know if that quite answers your question, but um, yeah, generally speaking, at least in Wisconsin, I can say that um, the worse soil you've got, the better off the plants are. And I actually went to Pennsylvania, near where my wife's family grew up, and they have um, serpentine soils there that are dominated by high um, metals content and, and naturally occurring um, minerals that are not very conducive to growth. And that's where you find the prairie. 
That's where the big blue stems grow, and that's where the prairie smoke is. So there's got to be something in these prairie plants that make them very tolerant of conditions that otherwise other plants just don't like. Um, that makes any sense. So yeah, I, I, you know, uh, and in fact, we're in incorporating nutrient status in the database because we feel that's a very important thing. If, you know, if you put your soil survey, if you take a soil sample and send it to any local or the state uh, extension service, and you can grow a bumper crop of corn on it for phosphorus and nitrogen, you, you've got a problem trying to get your prairie started. Um, you know, you can get rid of nitrogen by just continuously burning. So just putting out a vegetation to, and then letting the nitrogen grow in the atmosphere. Getting rid of phosphorus is very much, it's a much harder process. Uh, you can, you can hopefully they'll kind of go off the water, but then of course you're causing, you're shipping it down the, the Mississippi and down the Gulf and causing problems down there. Or if we're up here, it's like Lake Winnipeg, and then the Canadians all get at us for that. So uh, yeah, the, the nutrient status is a big deal, and uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> one of the things we've done is you know if you go and take soil surveys for most of the crop fields in this country, they found. You know, in certain places in Minnesota, 68% of them already have enough phosphorus in the spring to grow up a crop of corn because we've got a real problem with phosphorus on the landscape. And we're depositing nitrogen at a pretty high rate, too. In fact, if somebody's doing a study in South Dakota where they're actually doing the natural, natural rate of deposition of not nitrogen because we're putting so much more in. And we're changing plant communities just on that. So, you know, and this goes to the comment about novel communities. We're going to have a big problem with future nutrient status and trying to keep our species around. So, you know, one thing is maybe burning is a good thing and it's more or less a, a way to get rid of the nitrogen as fast as possible. Just send it back up into atmospheric nitrogen. Though, right? yeah. yeah. All right, question from Mike Malin. <clears throat> How has the recent pollinator interest changed or altered the way you design your seed mixes or manage your prairies? A holy cow moment of some sort, please, or a new ingenious way to manage or design prairies? Thank you. <laughs> well, I just make darn sure I have a bunch of milkweed in my mix now, so. Uh, whereas before, you know, I probably had it in there uh, for diversity's sake, but, um, now I'm definitely, yeah, I might even up the amount a little bit or something. So com common milkweed's pretty common. I never used to worry about it too much, but now it's a big deal. So. Yeah, I'm again greatly concerned about commercial mixes putting in. I mean, it's far easier to import a species that's not native to your area, like Echinacea purpurea is not native to Wisconsin, but you'd think it were the dominant plant based upon the prairies planted. Um, so I'm concerned about that. And also with milkweed though, we have seen an exponential jump in the sales of milkweed. I mean, we never would have sown common milkweed for plug production. We would have just stuck with the traditional butterfly bean, swamp milkweed. Swamp milkweed is an excellent plant for monarchs. I think they even prefer that more than the common milkweed if it's around. They'll easily come to plants in pots. Um, so I think we still have a problem with trying to keep the diversity up, so I would rather, um, instead of selling a lot of common milkweed, I wish people would buy um, one of the dozen or so species of, of milkweed common to Wisconsin that are found in the different habitats. And that's a challenge. It's a big challenge. So um, as I see it, every flowering plant that's not wind pollinated has a pollinator. And if we're only selecting out the plants that draw the pollinators that we can see, um, then we're missing out on all those other species again. But um, my wife has become totally taken by bumblebees. It's totally possessed her life now. And I think she's, up, she's almost up to a dozen species on her farm. And she's now concerned that we don't have enough acreage to support our bombus and finis <laughs> population. Um, but, you know, it's determining, boy, when I can burn, when I can mow. Everything now is for the bumblebees. Last comment from Diane. I just want to point out that, that it does affect um, 
how much you would burn and in what configuration because you don't want to burn all the habitat at one time because that takes away the resource. That's one thing. And the, the bees have different life stages, the butterflies have different life stages, and it's really important to consider what those life stages might be before you, you go ahead and burn. That said, you have to burn or you're not going to have the flowers. So uh, I just wanted to make that point and also to say that, that yeah, um, it's a lot more than butterflies. Pollinators are mostly the bees, and some of them are little sweat bees, but those little sweat bees can do a lot. So don't forget about the little guys. <laughs> Well, thank you to our panel members. Um, I know they'll be around. We've got a break here, so if you have more questions, um, track them down and ask them over that break. Um, we'll meet back at 3 or 3.05? Um, 3.05. I think 305? we need a 15-minute okay. break. <laughs> we'll have a 15-minute break, and we'll meet back here at 3.05.